أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد والثناء لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا بالقاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين Brothers and sisters, respected scholars, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So tonight is the, speaking about chapter 9 and the ninth characteristic or the ninth number. Um, and the hadith that I've chosen is on the authority of uh, Ja'far ibn Muhammad, as sadiq alayhi salam, where he says, when a person intends to do a good deed, when he has the niyyah to do a good deed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala writes it as a good deed for him. So you just need to have that niyyah, that intention. And from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he writes that deed for you. So on the day of judgment, you will get the reward for it. But once he actually performs that act, once he actually does that act, ten good deeds are written for him. So ten of that deed is written for him. And this is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have the intention, you get one good deed. You do the action, you get ten. However, if a person intends to do an evil deed, a sin, nothing is written for him. And if I have the intention of doing a bad deed from the mercy of Allah, no, nothing is written for me and I don't get punished for that. However, if I act upon it, what happens? If I act upon that deed, I'm given a certain amount of hours. How many hours? Nine hours, because we're in chapter nine. He, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you nine hours, according to the hadith. If within that nine hours, you have this window of nine hours. If within that nine hours, you are sorry, you are regretful for it. And you ask for forgiveness, and you repent within those nine hours, also nothing will be recorded for you. However, if he doesn't get sorry, if he doesn't ask for forgiveness and whatnot and he doesn't do toba within those nine hours, then the deed is recorded for him. So you have nine hours, brothers, and this is not uh, uh, justification, or I'm not giving you advice that you go and sin and then go feel sorry within that nine hours and then you get no sins. No, rather, if you perform a particular deed, a sin, you have nine hours. If you feel sorry, if you repent, if you do istighfar, nothing is written for it. After it, it's written. And then it becomes much difficult, much more difficult to erase that sin. It is possible, but it becomes much more difficult. So the purpose and the reason why I chose this is that it goes well, very well with what the sheikh said last night when he spoke about the, the different types of nufus, the different uh, stages of the, the soul. Let's interpret it as that. One of them, the middle one was a nafsal lawama, which was interpreted as the self-blaming soul. So when you and I, we, we commit a sin, and it is inevitable, we will be committing sins in our lifetime, one of the most important things is we are regretful for it. We blame ourselves for it. Not that it becomes normalized. Sometimes we commit sins so much, especially one particular sin, we do it so much that we no longer feel regretful. It becomes second nature. It becomes normal. We become desensitized to it. So it's very important to uh, feel regretful. And as well to do hisab and nafs, because there's that nine hours, nine hour window where Allah gives you a chance to do tawbah. So usually you commit the sin and then you have a window to do hisab and nafs. Sometimes in the spur of the mo moment when you're committing that sin, you're enjoying that sin, you, you're not thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but then... If you set a particular time in, in the day where you, you review your day and what you did and what you did wrong, then you have the chance to wipe away that or not have that sin record. Yeah. But one thing that's very important that I want to highlight is that when we're committing a sin, it's very important. This is the, 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 the most important thing that I want, to, want you to take from this lecture is that we're not happy and smiling. Sometimes when we're with, with, with our friends, we try and impress them. We try to do things that perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't be happy with, but your friends might be happy with. There's a, a hadith in Thawab um, al-A'mal wa Aqab al-A'mal by Shaykh al-Sudduq. Hadith number 82 where he says, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. 
من أذنب ذنبا وهو ضاحك دخل النار وهو باك The one who commits a sin while he is smiling Allah will enter him into the hellfire while he is crying So it's very important brothers and sisters and and in today's day and age it's very easy to be proud and boastful and happy about your your sins in the day and age of of Facebook of social media, of Snapchat. You know, without that, it's, it becomes difficult, a bit more difficult to sin and be proud of it and happy and share it amongst your friends. But with this new opportunity that you have to put your life in front of everyone, the, the simplest thing is Snapchat. You might be committing a sin and you know that it's only going to be 24 hours or whatnot until somebody can see that or maybe even you send it to them uh, what do you what do you do? Uh, I, I had it a long time ago. You send it to someone, and maybe ten seconds they can view it and never see it again. It becomes very easy, and and you'll notice that on on people's Snapchats they'll block people. They'll have only certain people. They'll have particular nicknames where no one can find them except the friends that they want to share their sins with. So it becomes very easy. But rather, with our sins, brothers and sisters, it's extremely important. We don't get into the habit of being happy with it, but always regretful. Always regretful. In Surah Ali Imran, I 135 to 136. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا fahisha." And as for those that commit a fahisha, fahisha is, is like a, a, an extremely bad sin, usually related to something like fornication or adultery. وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ أَظْلَمُوا أَنفُسِهِمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ أَظْلَمُوا أَظْلَمُوا ظَلَمُوا ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسِهِمْ أَنفُسَهُمْ If they, they commit a fahisha or, or they oppress their own souls. Now, some of the Mufassirin say that and oppress their own souls means it's something higher than fornication or adultery. Some say no. It means anything below fornication or adultery. But the point is, if you commit any sort of sin, if you commit any sort of, sort of sin, ذكرullah, those people that commit a sin, and immediately, immediately, ذكرullah, they remember Allah, or they mention Allah. ذكرullah can mean mention or remember Allah. فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَغْفَرُوا الذُّنُوبِ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَمْ يُصِرُّ عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ So the ayah says, if you, or those people that commit a sin, whether it's fornication, whether it's something greater than fornication, whether it's something very small, as long as you oppress your own souls with a sin, those people that remember Allah immediately, and they do not continue in persistence of doing that sin, they remember Allah immediately, and they don't continue in persistence, Allah will forgive their sins. And who will forgive their sins other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And then the next ayah says, أُولَٰئِكَ جِزَاءَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ مِّنْ رَبِّهِمْ وَجَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالَدِينَ فِيهَا وَنِعْمَ أَجْرُ الْعَامَلِينَ Those people, this is the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, usually when we read the Qur'an, and Allah talks about the reward of those people that are going to Jannah. He says, those people that do good deeds, that believe in Allah, that, that pray, that fast, that pay zakat, and so on and so forth, they will have what? Jannatin tajrimin tahtiha anha That will have paradise with rivers flowing in beneath. But look at this ayah. He says, those people that commit sins, but immediately remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will have paradise. They will have the ones that will have rivers flowing underneath them. Subhanallah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah is saying that he loves those who do repentance, that do tawbah, that just immediately repent. Because when we commit sins, brothers and sisters, a lot of the times we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely. And that's when it's dangerous. But those people who are committing the sin and remember Allah, those are the ones that will be remorseful, that will be sad, that will be unhappy that they have committed the sin. Zin, salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. There is a story 
that is, it is said in Tafsir al-Burhan. Tafsir al-Burhan is basically a Tafsir book that is purely done by the Ahadith of Ahlul Bayt. I mean, there's no commentary on it. There's no one saying this ayah means such and such. It's just Ahadith gathered together to explain these ayahs. Some of them will be weak Ahadith. Some of them will be strong Ahadith. Some of them will be Israeliyat. Hadith that, like uh, the Sheikh mentioned, um, it were inserted into our books. In any case, it's gathered from all our sources and put into it, either in a five-volume version or a ten-volume version. It's also found in Mali uh, al-Saduq, in, in the, the 11th chapter, the third hadith, and also Man la yahdharu al So it's in many of our important books. This hadith, and there's a lot of question marks about this hadith, by the way. Some people will say that this hadith cannot be accepted, they throw it on the wall. Some will, no, they'll try and reconcile it. I'll read the hadith and then we'll talk about the the, the discussion about if it's a valid hadith. Once there was a companion by the name of Ma'ad bin or Mu'ad bin Jabal. He was a companion of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Imam Ali alayhi sallam. And they say that he was not necessarily a good companion because he betrayed Imam Ali. But in any case, he came to the Prophet. He went to see the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, and he was crying. So the Prophet said, Salaamu Alaikum, he said, Wa Alaikum as -salam. He says, why are you crying? What is making you cry? He said, there is somebody at the door, he wanted to come see you. He's, you know, very attractive, he has, you know, a nice uh, um, uh, athletic body, he's very young, very youthful, and he's crying. So the Prophet said, get him to come inside. So he went and got him. And he saw that he was crying. The, the narrator said he saw that he was crying the way that a mother would cry over a lost son. I mean, yesterday we did the, uh, uh, the, the majlis for Ali al-Akbar, and before that, al-Qasim. And just from reading and, and feeling the emotions of what a mother would feel when she loses her son, you saw how we were crying. Now imagine this man came to the Prophet crying in this way. The Prophet said, well, why are you crying? So he said... I'm crying over my youth. And how can I not cry when I have committed such a sin that if Allah were to judge me for just a part or portion of that sin, he will take me to hell. So I'm sure if he looks at all of my sins, I'm definitely going to hell. And that, that I've got no hope in, in Jannah anymore. And he will never forgive me. So Rasulullah said, have you done shirk? Because what do we say the biggest sin is? Shirk, associating partners with Allah. Allah says in the Quran, this is the greatest of sins. And Allah will forgive every sin except for this. But even in the Quran, from his mercy, he forgave Bani Israel for committing shirk. But that's another story. He says, have you committed shirk for you to say that? He says, no way, subhanAllah. Walhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, I've never committed shirk. So the Prophet said, have you committed the crime of killing an innocent soul that Allah has said that you cannot kill? He says, no, I have not. So Rasulullah said, Allah, if you haven't committed these sins, Allah will forgive your sins, even if it's the size of an unmovable mountain or immovable mountain, a mountain that does not shake. He says, even if you have committed sins that much, he will forgive your sins. The man said, my sin is greater than this immovable mountain. So the Prophet said, Allah will forgive your sins, even if it's the size of the seven Earths, al ardin al sabh So imagine this earth times seven, and all of its oceans, and all, if we count in number the grains of sands, if the sins were like this, and the trees and all the creation within it, if you've committed a sin that big, Allah will forgive you. This guy says, No, my sin is bigger than that. Rasulullah said, If Allah will forgive you if you have committed a sin the size of the heavens and the skies and all the stars within it. And the, and the arsh included, and the kursi included, the throne in the chair. I mean, you can't get bigger than this, am I right? And, and, and Rasulullah saying this, say, look man, like, seriously, he's, he'll forgive you for anything. That's the rahmah of Allah. This guy, later we see his name is Bahlul, but not the same Bahlul that we hear stories of. Bahlul means foolish person. Sometimes they might have named him this because of, of the story, but in any case. So Rasulullah says, even if it's that big, he'll forgive you. He says, no, it's even bigger than that. So at this stage, the Prophet is kind of like, you know, getting a bit 
Yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm, tell, I'm the prophet, and I'm telling you, he's gonna forgive you. So he's like, are, are you saying that your sin is greater than Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? He says, well, well, billah. No, my, my sin is not greater than Allah. No, Allah is the greatest of all things. You cannot. Allah is akbar. He's greater than even what I can comprehend. He's definitely not bigger than this sin. So he says, so you, this great sin that you have. You don't think that Allah can forgive you for it? He said no. And he stayed silent. So Rasulullah is like, okay, fine. Will you at least tell me what this sin is? So he says, yes, I'll tell you. And he's boiling, boiling his eyes out at this stage. He says, one day, okay, so basically for the past seven years, he begins by saying, for the past seven years, you want to see how just a portion of my sins I'm going to be going to hell. But for the past seven years, my hobby was what? I would go to the graveyards and any body I would find, any grave I would find, I would dig up that body and I'd take it out. I'd take off the kefen, you know, the cloth that they have. I'd take it out and just leave it there. And I'd leave it there. I'd go. Next day, anyone who was buried, I'd do the same thing. So one day, I mean, that's, that's enough, isn't it? That's enough. Some people know this, this story already and they're raising eyebrows because I'm mentioning it, but please be patient with me, inshallah. That's enough. But he said one day there was a, a death from the daughters of the Ansar, the, the, the people of Medina. There was a death from one of their daughters and after they had you know, washed her and put her in a kefen and buried her and the families had left, I went and dug the grave I, I removed the kefen, put her on the side, and I walked off. As I was walking off, shaitan began whispering in my ear. He said, did you actually see that girl? You know, she's, she was, you know, had nice fair skin. She had a nice face. You know, what are you doing walking away? So he started walking back, and shaitan kept talking, you know, whispering in his ear until he arrived there. And then he had his way with her, Okay. In the end, he did an evil act. So he, from this point onwards, he, this never left him. It remained in his heart, and this was why he was always crying. So once he explained this to the prophets, remember we said that the prophet, when he sees or hears a sin, does he actually see, see it like we see it? We spoke about this already. He sees something else. He sees the reality of that sin. He doesn't see it in the way that we see it, but he sees how it would look like in the Akhirah. For example, if we were drinking alcohol, it would be as if we were drinking fire. If we were backbiting, it would be as if he was eating the flesh of his brother. So this thing, this particular sin, he saw it, the reality of it, and it was like basically flames all around this person. He basically, while he was telling his story, he saw flames around him. And this startled the prophet, and he said, you know, Basically, he was so shocked by it, he said, you know, please stay away from me. I can't help you here. Imagine the prophet. The prophet sent as a mercy to mankind. He said, I can't help you here. So this man, he went, he ran off. You know, the prophet said, I can't help you. Please, you know, I'm scared that the fire will get me. He ran off. He went to Medina. He bought some stuff. And then he went to a mountain far, far away. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He went to this mountain and he wore like really rough clothes, not comfortable clothes, rough clothes. And he grabbed some chains and he shackled his arms to his neck. And he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am your humble servant. I am your foolish servant. And I've come to you with my hands shackled. And I say, by your name and your majesty and your greatness, do not disappoint me. Do not invalidate my supplication and don't make me despair from your mercy. Yani, uh, this is my last hope. I'm asking you now by your mercy because I went to your prophet and now I'm even more fearful because if the prophet did this, what hope do I have? Zian, so he started doing this for 40 days. Every day he would cry. Every day he would supplicate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the point that the animals, even the animals around him, they began to cry. 
in the narration. It says that even the animals started to cry, even the predators. It says the predators, you know, when the predators see somebody, what are they going to do? They think that lunch and dinner is, is served. But even them, from the way he was crying, they started crying. And so he kept on going and going and going. And then he, he, he started changing his tone as well. He would start saying things like, Oh Allah, what did you do regarding to my need? He started asking Allah after 40 days, What have you done? What have you chosen? If you have answered my supplication and forgiven me my mistake, then reveal something to your prophet. Reveal something. Bring an ayah down. Get Jibra'il to tell him something. And if you did not answer my supplication and you have not forgiven my mistake for me, and you intend to punish me, then allow that fire to just completely destroy me. I cannot live with the guilt anymore. And if not, even better, then punish me in this world so in the next world I don't face any punishment. Then Allah revealed the ayah. Which ayah? The ayah that I mentioned before. What was the ayah? وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً if, and those people who committed an indecency, a fornication or whatnot, the, in the tafsir it says, يعني الزنا, meaning fornication. ظلموا أنفسهم, أنفسهم, and oppressed their own soul, meaning they did something greater than that, because what was the sin of this person? Even greater than that. Until the end of the ayah. This particular ayah was revealed upon who? This person. So then this was brought down to Rasulullah and Rasulullah took this and he went and he said he went to his companion he says who of you guys know where this guy this person is now So Muath he says I know where he is so he took him to him So they went there and uh, he said to his companions look look at this person he's got his hands tied to his neck and he's crying and they heard that he kept on going he said, you, oh Allah, you created my face handsome. If only you could make me aware of what it is that you have intended for me. It is the fire that you intend to burn me with, or is it to be somewhere near you? Notice that there's something that has changed here. When he came to the Prophet, what was he saying? What was he saying? There's no way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive me. But what's he saying now? Oh Allah, there's a bit of hope, isn't it? Have you chosen this for me? Or have you chosen that? Then, and so when, he's, when Rasulullah got there and he saw them, he said to his companions, he said to his companions, look at how this person is, is acting. His eyes were completely gone, almost blind. You remember with the story of Yusuf? He almost went blind from crying. He says, look at this man. This is how you should be doing Tawbah. This is how you should be doing Tawbah. And then it ends with, لا صغير مع الإصرار ولا كبير مع الاستغفار. And this is an extremely important message at the end of this hadith. He says, there is no sin, there is no minor sin, no small sin that is put together with persistence. Meaning what? If you have, uh, you have a small sin, what's a small sin? Let's just say something like lying, if that's a small sin. Lying cannot be put together with persistence. Why? Because if it's a small sin and you persist in it, what does it become? A big sin. And then it says, and there is no major sin along with forgiveness, istighfar. Why? Because if it's a big, big sin, like say zina, and you put it alongside forgiveness, what does that sin become? Erased. It's no longer a sin. Because with the istighfar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His mercy, it's gone. So eventually what happened was this person was freed and Allah basically gave him good news of Jannah. Now what's the moral behind of this story? What's the moral behind it? The moral is that this particular man went to the Prophet. I'm almost done inshallah. He went to the Prophet. He had absolutely no hope in the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is one of the greatest sins, by the way. What does the ayah say in the Quran? Actually, tell me because I don't know. Let me get it up. What does the ayah say? <laughs> no. <laughs> all right, all right. The one about, you know, don't, don't lose hope in the. Ahsent. Ahsentum. Qul ya abadi alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim la taqnatu min rahmatillah. 
إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم O oh my servants, do not lose hope in the mercy of Allah Those people that have, have, that have been excessive upon their souls Those who have done, committed so many sins You know, honestly, sometimes we wonder I have committed so many sins How will Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me? How? How? But this ayah is so powerful, it's saying, in fact, if you look at the, the book, Major Sins, I think it's what, that's what it's called, yeah? By Dustaqayb Shirazi, 40 major sins, yeah? 40 major sins. It, it combines the 40 major sins according to that hadith in the Quran. The first one is shirk. What's the second one? Losing hope in the mercy of Allah. Bigger than the sin that this person, Bahlul, committed was what? Losing the hope. In the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when he approached the Prophet, and this is the question mark. This is the question mark that's usually approached. Because can the mercy of Allah and the mercy of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam can be opposing? For example, can Allah be merciful to someone and Rasulullah be unf unforgiving and harsh upon a person? Is it possible in the, in the aqeedah of the, 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 the Shia? Is it possible or not? That Imam Ali... Or Imam Hassan or Imam Hussein are fighting someone and Allah is showing mercy to the person that they're fighting. Is it possible? Absolutely not. In fact, in Surah An Nisa, Ayah 64, what does it say? It says to the Prophet that if those people who had done zulm on their nafs, had committed oppression or injustice upon their soul, had they come to who? To you, O Prophet. Had they come to you, O Prophet. And sought the forgiveness of Allah through you. And you sought the forgiveness of Allah for them. Then Allah would have forgiven them. This is extremely important. Because we use who as a wasila? Wasila. Who? Rasulullah. The A'imma of Ahlul Bayt. Babu al-Hawa'ij. Who is Babu al-Hawa'ij? We say that one of them is, for example, Abbas alayhi salam. We go to them to ask them to ask Allah for forgiveness. But their mercy, their forgiveness is coupled. Because if, if Rasulullah forgives them, then of course Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them. Zin. So what about this case? Rasulullah is saying, get away from me. I see the fire surrounding you. But there was a difference when Allah forgave him and when he at first approached the Prophet. What was it? Uh -huh. At that time he approached the Prophet He had no hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala So put that coupled with his sin Of course he said there's going to be fire around him But the, through the reaction of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam He saw that there is no one better to approach than Allah himself And that if he has hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Then he will gain the mercy of Allah That is Tawbah brothers and sisters Therefore in summary In summary what is the lessons that we learn? Number one, when we commit a sin, brothers and sisters, don't be happy about it. Don't share it with people, but rather feel sorry about it. If you're sorry about it, you're not going to be sharing it with other people. Have regret. Remember Allah. That's the second thing. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mention Allah. Say astaghfirullah. Say astaghfirullah. And the third thing is do tawbah. Some of it require just being regretful. Some of it you have to pay a kafara. Sometimes you have to pay money for it. For example, if you break your fast during Ramadan on purpose, you have to do something. Yes, Allah will forgive you, but you still have to do something. Pay money or, or feed a, 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 a poor person and so on and so forth. That's number three. Number four, never ever give up in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one example that we can give is who? Hur, Hur bin Yazid al-Riyahi. Even when Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam said to him, may your mother mourn you. I mean, when, when Imam Hussein said that, even through that, just like Rasulullah, there was something that clicked with him. And he remembered that who is his mother? Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. And therefore, he did not give up in the mercy of Allah when he changed his path. He went from hellfire to paradise to the point, to the point where he said, even if they were to cut me up, if you were to cut me up in 1,000 pieces and those pieces would blow in the wind 
And then those pieces were brought back. And I was asked the same question. Do I choose Imam Hussein or do I choose to be enslaved to my soul? Do I choose paradise or do I choose hell? Even if we did that a thousand times, I would still choose Imam Hussein. Because that's going from nafs al-lawama to nafs al-mutma'inna. And inshallah, the Shaykh will be touching on that. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.